so now I get to introduce you to uh, first person I've introduced today, I knew before today. Uh, ben is our Divisional Director of Emergency Services for the Salvation Army, and um, he's a, a really committed fellow, and he served um, but internationally, but also regionally and locally. Uh, he doesn't just organize the response of the Salvation Army, he also uh, participates in those responses because he just, he just can't say no. We're very glad to have him with us. He served in the Canadian Armed Forces before that, but uh, Ben is, is, works very hard, very diligently in developing the teams uh, across Alberta and the Northern Territories. Um, but he's going to come and explain the Salvation Army's role in the Canadian Humanitarian Workforce Program, a uh, new initiative with the federal government, and it highlights the Salvation Army's capacity for emergency and disaster services across the Alberta and Northern Territories Division. You have to invent it. Be here. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I've heard some great speakers, seen some great stuff, and I'm honored to be here. Because first off, I didn't know what I was getting into when I came. Um, so I'm going to talk about the humanitarian workforce because we've been invited as we're part of that humanitarian workforce. We've been one of the chosen ones. So um, I know it's late in the afternoon and I'm the last speaker. So I got the privilege to try and keep you awake. So instead of doing yoga classes or anything like that, I was going to start with a video. Throughout modern times, our civilization has managed to survive numerous disasters of epic proportions. In the aftermath of every one of those tragedies, man's spirit has always managed to lift itself from the rubble and carry on. September 11, 2001 was no exception. But what is it about mankind that allows us the ability to learn from such a misfortune as the bombing of the World Trade Center? The answer is simple, others. There is a particular group of people who have become a common thread in disaster relief throughout the world in the past century. They are the people who feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, mend the wounded, and console the brokenhearted. They are the people in blue, the people of the Salvation Army. A healing touch in a suffering world and the soothing whisper of an angel's breath. Never seeking accolades, fortune, or praise, they are simply unsung. Who are they? Where do they come from? Why do they do what they do? They appear as if from nowhere, and when they've finished helping those in need, they vanish, never having asked for so much as a thank you for all of their kind deeds. A society that bases happiness on fortune and profit. Why do these people insist on giving their resources and services for free? Who are the people of the Salvation Army? The first women to serve in the Army in a war was with the Salvation Army in World War uh, I. Uh, the fourth general of the Salvation Army, General Evangeline Booth, went right into General Pershing's office and uh, firmly and persuasively convinced the general that the Salvation Army should be allowed to send officers to the front lines in World War I. And hence, the, uh, a few young women left in New York City and ended up in tents right on the front lines, just uh, yards and uh, no more than a half a mile back from the front lines. And there they ministered to the, uh, to the men fighting, uh, giving them comfort and prayer, reading scripture, and most importantly of all, serving donuts. So they became known as the Donut Girls, and posters went up throughout the United States urging people to support uh, the Donut Girls who were serving on the front lines. Well, the styles change. The uh, Army uh, volunteers and officers, soldiers and volunteers today look quite different than the Donut Girls of World War I. And what we serve may be a little different. 
but basically it comes from the same motivation, and that is for no other purpose but to be there in a time of crisis, to help people in the name of Christ, without any strings attached, uh, just simply to be there through the love of God to uh, help people in his name. Well, Salvation Army was founded by uh, William Catherine Booth in 1865 in London, England. The Salvation Army is an international Christian organization. It began its work here in Canada in 1882. The Salvation Army is active in 131 countries. Our international leader is a general. Its headquarters is in London, England, and it's currently a Canadian. So the Salvation Army provides support directly to anyone who requires it in your community, in your own back area. Friends, we do this service day in, day out. In our frontline services, our family services, what we call it, our programs, they may be done in separate buildings. They may be done in our churches. We, in all different sorts of people, we walk alongside people. We do this daily. We are the largest non-governmental social services agents. So in many of our cities and towns, we are the food bank. In Edmonton in particular, we rent distribution sites for the food bank. But we are not just a food bank or a resource center. We're a resource center, we provide clothing. When we have provide a listening ear, what is that person's problem? What do they need? To do? We help the people tackle their problems, either by providing for their immediate needs ourselves or walking with them to the right person and or agency that can deal with that situation. So day in, day out, the Salvation and Army provides shelters community meal programs, and drop-in centers for both men and women, traditional housing, rehabs, and supportive recovery housing. Not to mention the newest one we're getting into, which is warming stations in the winter. I got a little video. exciting project for the Salvation Army definitely because it's new and there's a lot of advantages to being mobile. We're able to go to where there is need. The mobile warming station has been really well received by the community. Often we hear from some of our repeat clients that we see on like a regular basis that as soon as they see the Salvation Army shield in the distance they immediately know what this is and if they go there that they're going to be cared about. Therefore, it should not be a surprise to hear that an extension of our front lines, the emergency disaster services, has begun over 100 plus years ago with that devastating Galveston, Texas hurricane. It's not a surprise for Salvation Army officers to have brought counseling, comfort, practical aid. Now our first response, which most of you in this room know, in Canada was at the uh, 1917 Halifax explosion. And we also heard in the video of the donut girls, not only World War I, but World War II. Canteen trucks that we have. Now we got messes that we call them in the military, but the canteens started, or your messes started with the canteens because we were at the war. So our Salvation Army, emergency disaster teams, they go wherever there is hardship, wherever there is natural man-made disasters. Most of the time we live in the community right along with you. And so we're there to assist those that are affected. They're affected by the emergency that's at hand. Our assistance long-term through the disaster phase, the initial part, and ongoing to recovery, we're feeding people that are fixing things, getting infrastructure back on a rebuild process. It's comprised 
of officers, employees, and volunteers. These are our EDS teams. These are emergency disaster teams. And they're often the first support unit to arrive and many times the last ones to leave. Teams are well-trained. They're well-trained in various aspects of response and recovery. Through participa participation in our national training program, which is offered both in Canada and the United States, that we can serve both sides of that border. Salvation Army across Canada and the United States. The Salvation Army's disaster focuses on five key aspects. Food and water, spiritual comfort, emotional support, critical stress incident management, donation management, and financial assistance. Now our strategy is simple. It's really, what are we gonna do immediately? What are we going to do within days? And what are we going to do within months? You can read that there up on the, uh, on the screen. Now, this may include providing meals, food preparation, shelter, clothing, drivers, chaplains, group or individual crisis inter intervention for stress management, finance and administration, warehouse, communications, and planning. See, friends, our paramilitary structure with thousands of officers and soldiers and employees and volunteers are at the ready, enabling us to quickly and efficiently mobilize large groups, large groups of vehicles, large groups of people, and implement a network of distribution sites so that we can help depending on what the need is in the face of that disaster. The Salvation Army offers, though, more than just physical comfort. In the wake of a disaster, for followers of Christ, the Salvation Army also offers pastoral care in the form of chaplaincy during the crisis, caring for the needs of the spirit as well as the body. Now, this is not about us. It's not about me being a Christian. This is about that person, what their belief system is, and they may not even have a belief system. This may be, for example, about that person right there, and that person may want to talk to a rabbi. We'll find them. That's where we're coming from. So see, the Salvation Army's ministry begin, begins with a bottle of water, physical comfort, but our compassion and our mercy to those we serve should reflect the very love that's in our heart comes from Christ. So the simple gift of water or food or a listening ear, it's a transforming effect. It touches the person on the inside. And it transforms in that way. So whether it's at 3 a.m. and I'm at a house fire or a flood across many municipalities, Salvation Army is ready and able to respond anywhere there is need. Even if the affected area doesn't have a Salvation Army presence. Past large scales responses in the Alberta and Northern Territories that we responded to, they, they include, and you can read them, see they're on the screen. Each disaster is unique. There are certain basic needs to which the Salvation Army responds. Response and recovery services may include, but they're not limited to. Registration, leader and greeters, spiritual comfort, emotional support, feeding, sheltering, managing reception centers, critical stress incident management, donation management, warehousing and logistics. Now that's a huge list. We don't always do it. This is a big note that I'm gonna say, we're capable of doing all of those, but we're not necessarily asked in every case to do them, but we have done them in the past in many different various areas and locations. So it goes by a case-by-case -case scenario. So let's talk about spiritual comfort. Spiritual comfort and emotional support. We take care of survivors and first responders. We take care of our own workers, our own officers, our staff and volunteers. We do funeral and memorial services, if that's what's necessary. We respect all faiths and all beliefs. Like it says, 
If they need a map and need to be pointed towards Mecca, we're going to make that happen. We respect all of this. Sometimes we use other face interface or multi professionals in order to get this job done. We're we'll going to food services. The most visible, of course, was the very first picture I showed you, which is a canteen truck. People see that truck, they move food there, because they know there's comfort. Food. They're heading towards, that's what's your most visible. But this food that's on it could be prepared in a fixed feeding unit, like could be prepared in this conference center, could be prepared in a community center, could be prepared in one of our churches, could be prepared in any fixed structure. Or it could be off of one of our canteen trucks, or what we call our community response units. Um, and that, that's um, a full flown uh, commercial kitchen on wheels, is what it is if you don't know. So that's the comfort. That's what we're handing out first. So these meat, they provide hot cold beverages, hot meals, um, sandwiches. You feed up off of one of them trucks, anywhere from uh, 1,000 to 1,500 meals per day. Uh, we have various sizes. I can do more than that. Uh, so they're all generated, generator powered, and they've all been also. So then we get into emergency assistance. The essential needs are food, of course, clothing, shelter, medications, personal needs, hygiene kits. You don't have those basic needs, you're not talking to the folks because that's what's on their mind. So this assistance, it can be maybe provided through voucher system, could be provided through checks, it could be provided through gift cards. That's how we get our donation management to them, which is what our next topic is, is donation management. We go for in-kind donations and monetary donations. That's what we ask for first from John Q. Public because we don't usually have the capacity when you're at a disaster to have a warehouse. Oh, we got a warehouse over here that I can start stockpiling, which is warehousing, which we've been asked to do because John Q. Public is so kind. They got to use table downstairs. Let's put it on that semi truck. We got this. Well, let's give it to them. You know, the survivors, they don't have nothing. They're going to need it. So truckloads are coming. Sometimes unbeknownst to us. Many times we walk up to a tent, they look at us and say, Salvation Army, can you take care of that? And here we go. So donation management, we're doing warehousing. But we're also doing warehousing in stockpile of food uh, and basic humanitarian needs that we're going to need right at the time. Uh, we also solicit donations, so we go after specific things. And, of course, ongoing case management with the individual. We never lose sight of the individual, vouchers, and gift cards. So here's a picture of High River 2013 floods. Donated, donated, donated. Three trailers, Brands Bank and them. Two blocks away is our family services. We live there in our thrift store. They were all underwater. They're not workable right now. Off to the left of those pictures is our church, and we have a restoration team in it at the present time. We're in the parking lot with the donations, and then we're turning one of them trailers into a thrift store, one into a family services, and one into a registration so that High River personnel can get back to business and we can be heading home. So that's where we do our recovery phase, trying to get them on their feet. So this is the type of work that we're doing. And here is Slade Lake Food Depot. We created a food depot at the Slade Lake. So long-term recovery, we get a long-term recovery. Of course, we're going to need continuation of cleanup kits. Again, case management's there one-on-one -on -one with, with the folks, touching base with them, make sure they're doing all right. Corporate uh, partnerships continue to go, uh, and they keep uh, either supplying as monetary or within kind donations and supply distribution, we get that as monetary or donations out to the people. So who do we serve? Survivors and their family, of course, police, fire departments, EMS, military, government, First Nations, other NGOs, work crews. And who do we partner with, partner and cooperate with? Red Cross, St. John Ambulance, Search and Rescue, Local health units, 
humane society, municipalities, province, amateur radio groups, Samaritan Purse. So what kind of local responses do we respond to? Back, evacuations, pardon me, search and rescue, fires, floods, power outages, severe weather alerts, pandemic, influenza, first responder funerals, and tornadoes. But we also do special events like parades, Olympic torch relay, remembrance day, emergency preparedness, presentations and displays, and most recently, pop outs. So we use volunteers. We use a lot of volunteers. And so volunteers are trained and they, and they, for all aspects of what we do. So they're trained as drivers, trained as food, food preparation and handling. They're trained in crisis intervention. They're trained in chaplains. They're trained in finance and in mint. They're trained in communication. They're trained in planning and they're trained in response leadership. So then who is it that goes to these disasters and responds for the Salvation Army? They're mission partners which consists of our officers, like myself, our employees, all in-house people. They will all jump in. We also have, we also have soldiers. Now soldiers is like, they're members of our church is what they are. They're jumping in. They're coming in and to help. And we also have service partners, people that are outside, not necessarily workforce, but there are businesses that contribute to the army. They're, there's businesses that will send out employees as volunteers to help us. So we have a whole crew, contractors that want to help when the time, time happens. So now let's get on to what we have, our fleet. We have a 35 foot kitchen trailer that's based in Edmonton. We have a 16 foot trailer based in High River. We have a serving unit based in Lloyd Minister. Transit serving unit. We have three of these kitchen trucks, one in Grand Prairie, one in Edmonton, one in Calgary. And we have two bread style trucks like this. One's in Fort Mac, and one is down in the southern part of our province at uh, Lethbridge. And they have what we call a chase vehicle. That's what runs to the grocery store to get groceries, to get to the back of the kitchen, so we get the kitchen set up. So we call them chase vehicles. But we can draw from 60 canteen trucks that we have scattered across Canada, not to mention the hundreds if you need to, we can draw from the United States. That's why we have that bilateral togetherness. And so we have it at our fingertips if we need to go there. And now that brings me to the humanitarian workforce program. Or further yet, what is the humanitarian workforce program? This program supports capacity building for four national non-government organizations. And I'm going to name them. Namely, it's the Red Cross, Salvation Army, it's the St. John's Ambulance, and St. John's Ambulance, and it's the Search and Rescue Volunteer Association of Canada. Those are the four. Right? So what does that mean for us, capacity building? What it really means, it allows us to enhance our workforce, to do recruitment, to do training, to give some um, infrastructure into our training, not trucks. We're not giving us more trucks and high end stuff. We're giving us like computers, stuff like that that we need to do in training. So we can have people trained at every corner of our country. That's what it's doing for us. But this program also provides funding for deployment of surge resources for domestic emergency events such as COVID-19, floods and wildfires in response to requests submitted to the Fed for federal assistance. So what does that all mean in that paragraph that I just read? What it means is when we have a larger scale disaster to occur, your province or your territory can reach out to the federal government for assistance because there's both funding and resources for you. And in saying that, 
the federal government has said they will continue to talk with provinces, the territories, indigenous partners, and stakeholders, as us, by the way, as to what that need is going forward and how can we enhance it. So there's still dialogue going on, even though they've already started with this funding for NGOs. So in closing, I want to sum up this presentation with our commissioner, Mr. Uh, Floyd Tig, Territorial Commander of the Salvation Army Canada. He commented on the humanitarian workforce with this quote. Since the Halifax explosion in 1917, the Salvation Army has been there for Canadians, facing emergencies of all sizes. From the British Columbia floods, the ongoing emergency response in the face of COVID-19, support for this humanitarian workforce program helped us serve more Canadians last year than ever before. Filling urgent needs, providing hope, letting people know they're not alone. What a wonderful quote. What we did do, able to help more people. But what we believe is everyone, everyone is entitled to receive assistance with respect and dignity. That's what concludes my presentation. Is there any questions? Oh, uh, so you say that you have cross-border cooperation within your operations. And I'm curious to see what kind of challenges that you face doing so. What kind of challenges you face doing so? Yes. Uh, we're in network. So if I need to, uh, uh, let's say, draw in, uh, we'll start with, if I'm the province in Alberta and I have to draw in BC, I go through my division commander, one phone call, or we can call the other division commander, and then it trickles down and it's, it's not... Um, bureauc bureaucracy or red tape is quick. And what do I need that? Um, I need more trucks, how many? So it depends on the magnitude, it depends on what I got briefed from these emergency management teams. When they're calling me to come forward, they're telling me how many people I'm gonna have to serve. Do I have that capacity? If I don't, I will get it. And it won't, it won't take long. And then if it has to go internationally over the uh, space, it's just another phone call higher and boom, it goes across. So it depends again. Many times we're called and so say get teams ready and they fly us down and we use their equipment. We've done that with Katrina with uh, 9 11. We we're down in 9 11. We we're down in Katrina. So because we work in rings, so how it works with the Salvation Army is we have Alberta goes in and is dealing with the situation. We go in for two weeks. We go home and rest, and maybe Saskatchewan comes in for two weeks. Then they go home, and then BC might come in. But when we've exhausted all those resources, we might reach out. Make sense?